In 1856, John Rapier, a free black barber in Florence, Alabama, urged his four freeborn sons to flee the increasingly repressive and dangerous South. Nineteen-year-old James T. Rapier chose Canada, where he went to live with his uncle in a largely black community and studied in a log schoolhouse. In a letter to his father, he vowed, I will endeavor to do my part in solving the problems of African Americans in my native land. The Union victory in the Civil War gave James Rapier the opportunity to redeem his pledge. In 1865, after more than eight years in exile, Rapier returned to Alabama, where he presided over the first political gathering of former slaves in the state. He soon discovered, however, that Alabama's whites found it agonizingly difficult to accept defeat and black freedom. They responded to the revolutionary changes under the banner, White man, right or wrong, still the white man. During the elections of 1868, when Rapier and other Alabama blacks vigorously supported the Republican ticket, the recently organized Ku Klux Klan went on a bloody rampage. A mob of 150 outraged whites raced through Rapier's neighborhood seeking four black politicians they claimed were trying to quote-unquote Africanize Alabama. They caught and hanged three, but Rapier escaped. After briefly considering fleeing the state, Rapier decided to stay and fight for his rights. In 1872, Rapier won election to the House of Representatives, where he joined six other black congressmen in Washington, D.C. Defeated for re-election in 1874 in a campaign marked by ballot box stuffing, Rapier turned to cotton farming. But unrelenting racial violence convinced him that blacks could never achieve equality and prosperity in the South. He purchased land in Kansas and urged Alabama's blacks to escape with him. In 1883, however, before he could leave Alabama, the 45-year-old Rapier died of tuberculosis. In 1865, Union General Carl Schurz had foreseen many of the troubles Rapier encountered in the post-war South. The Civil War, Schurz observed, was a revolution but half accomplished. He meant that while Northern victory had freed the slaves, it had not changed former slaveholders' minds about blacks' unfitness for freedom. Left to themselves, whites would introduce some new system of forced labor, not perhaps exactly slavery in its old form, but something similar to it, Schertz predicted. To defend their freedom, blacks would need federal protection, land of their own, and voting rights. Until whites cut loose from the past, it will be a dangerous experiment to put Southern society upon its own legs. As Schertz understood, the end of the war did not mean peace. Indeed, the nation entered one of its most turbulent and violent eras, Reconstruction. Answers to the era's central questions about the defeated South's status within the Union and the meaning of freedom for ex-slaves came from many directions and often clashed. In Washington, D.C., the federal government played an active role, passing the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution that strengthened the claim of African Americans to equal rights. But state legislatures and county seats across the South also featured blacks and whites vigorously disagreeing about the future of the South. The struggle over the future also took place on the South's farms and plantations, where former slaves sought to become free workers while former slaveholders clung to old, oppressive habits. Whites often backed their opinions with racial violence. In the end, the efforts of African Americans and their allies to secure full citizenship and racial equality failed. In the contest to determine the consequences of Confederate defeat and emancipation, white Southerners prevailed. Reconstruction did not wait for the end of the war. As the odds of a Northern victory increased, Thinking about reunification quickened, but who had authority to devise a plan for reconstructing the Union? President Abraham Lincoln firmly believed that reconstruction was a matter of executive responsibility. Congress just as firmly asserted its jurisdiction. Fueling the argument were significant differences about the terms of reconstruction. In their eagerness to formulate a plan for political reunification, Neither Lincoln nor Congress gave much attention to the South's land and labor problems. Yet the war rapidly eroded slavery, and Union military commanders in the occupied areas of the Confederacy had no choice but to oversee the emergence of a new labor system. As early as 1863, 
Lincoln began contemplating how to bind up the nation's wounds and achieve a lasting peace. While deep compassion for the enemy guided his thinking about peace, his plan for Reconstruction aimed primarily at shortening the war and ending slavery. Lincoln's proclamation of amnesty and Reconstruction in December 1863 set out his terms. He offered a full pardon, restoring property, apart from slaves of course, and political rights to most rebels willing to renounce secession and to accept emancipation. When 10% of a state's voting population had taken an oath of allegiance, the states could organize a new government and be readmitted into the Union. Lincoln's plan did not require ex-rebels to extend civil rights to ex-slaves, nor did it anticipate a program of long-term federal assistance to freedmen. Clearly, the president looked forward to the rapid, forgiving restoration of the broken Union. Lincoln's easy terms enraged abolitionists such as Wendell Phillips of Boston, who charged that the president makes the Negro's freedom a mere sham. He is willing that the Negro should be free, but seeks nothing else for him. Phillips and other northern radicals called instead for a thorough overhaul of southern society. Their ideas proved to be too drastic for most Republicans during the war years, but Congress agreed that Lincoln's plan was inadequate. In July 1864, Congress put forward a plan of its own. Congressman Henry Winter Davis of Maryland and Senator Benjamin Wade of Ohio jointly sponsored a bill that demanded that at least half of the voters in a conquered rebel state take an oath of allegiance to the United States before Reconstruction could begin. The Wade-Davis bill also banned almost all former Confederates from participating in the drafting of new state constitutions. Finally, the bill guaranteed the equality of freedmen before the law. Congress's Reconstruction would be neither as quick nor as forgiving as Lincoln's. When Lincoln refused to sign the bill and let it die, Wade and Davis charged the president with tyranny. Undeterred, Lincoln continued to nurture the formation of loyal state governments under his own plan. Four states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Virginia, fulfilled the president's requirements, but Congress refused to seat representatives from the quote-unquote Lincoln states. In his last public address in 1865, Lincoln defended his plan but expressed his endorsement of voting rights for Southern blacks, at least, quote, the very intelligent and those who serve our cause as soldiers, end quote. The announcement demonstrated that Lincoln's thinking about Reconstruction was still evolving. Four days later, however, he was dead. Of all the problems raised by the North's victory in the war, none proved more critical than the South's transition from slavery to free labor. As federal armies occupied the Confederacy, hundreds of thousands of slaves became free workers. In addition, Union armies controlled vast territories in the South where legal title to land had become unclear. The Confiscation Acts passed during the war punished traders by taking away their property. The question of what to do with federally occupied land and how to organize labor on it engaged ex-slaves, ex-slaveholders, Union military officers, and federal government officials long before the war ended. In the Mississippi Valley, occupying federal troops announced a new labor scheme. It required landholders to give up whipping, sign contracts with ex-slaves, pay wages, and provide food, housing, and medical care. The scheme also required black laborers to enter into contracts, work diligently, and remain subordinate and obedient to whites. The Union military clearly had no intention of promoting a social or economic revolution. Instead, they sought to restore traditional plantation agriculture, this time using wage labor. The effort resulted in a hybrid system that one contemporary called compulsory free labor, which satisfied no one. Planters complained because the new system fell short of slavery. Blacks could not be transformed by proclamation, a Louisiana sugar planter declared. Without the right to whip, he argued, the new labor system did not have a chance. Either Union soldiers must compel them to work, or the planters themselves must be authorized and sustained in using force. African Americans found the new regime too similar to slavery to be called free labor. Its chief deficiency, they knew, was the failure to provide them with land of their own. Freedmen believed they had a moral right to land because they and their ancestors had worked it without pay for centuries. 
Several wartime developments led Friedman to believe that the federal government planned to defend black freedom with land ownership. In January 1865, General William Tecumseh Sherman set aside part of the coast south of Charleston, South Carolina for black settlement. By June, some 40,000 freedmen sat on 400,000 acres of quote-unquote Sherman land. In addition, in March 1865, Congress passed a bill establishing the Bureau of Refugees, Freedom, and Abandoned Lands. The Freedmen's Bureau, as it was called, distributed food and clothing to destitute Southerners and eased the transition of blacks from slaves to free persons. Congress also authorized the agency to divide abandoned and confiscated land into 40-acre plots to rent them to freedmen and eventually to sell them with such title as the United States can convey. By June 1865, the Bureau had situated nearly 10,000 black families on one-half million acres. Despite the flurry of activity, wartime Reconstruction failed to produce agreement about whether the President or Congress had the authority to devise policy or what that proper policy should even be. Former slaves never had any doubt about what they wanted from freedom. They had only to contemplate what they had been denied as slaves. To whites, emancipation looked like pure anarchy, but while former slaves experimented with freedom, soon most were back at work in whites' kitchens and fields. But they continued to dream of land and independence. The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land, one former slave declared in 1865, and turn it and till it by our own labor. A South Carolina freedman agreed, declaring that ex-slaves wanted land, quote, not a master or owner, neither a driver with his whip, end quote. Slavery had deliberately kept blacks illiterate, and freedmen emerged from bondage eager to learn to read and write. Freedmen looked on schools as the first proof of their independence. The restoration of broken families was another persistent black aspiration. Thousands of freedmen took to the roads in 1865 to look for family who had been sold or to free those who were still being held illegally as slaves. Independent worship was another dream. African Americans greeted freedom with a mass exodus from white churches where they had been required to worship when slaves. Some joined the newly established southern branches of all-black northern churches, such as the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Others formed black versions of the major southern denominations, the Baptists and the Methodists. Abraham Lincoln died on April 15, 1865, just hours after John Wilkes Booth shot him in a Washington, D.C. theater. Vice President Andrew Johnson of Tennessee then became president. Congress had adjourned in March and would not reconvene until December. Throughout the summer and fall, Johnson drew up and executed a plan of reconstruction without congressional advice. Congress returned to the Capitol in December to find that, as far as the new president and former Confederates were concerned, reconstruction was over. Most Republicans, however, thought Johnson's plan made far too demands of ex-rebels and made a mockery of the sacrifice of Union soldiers. They claimed that Johnson's leniency had encouraged the rebirth of the Old South, that he had achieved political reunification at the cost of black freedom. Republicans in Congress then proceeded to dismantle Johnson's program and substitute a program of their own. Born in 1808 in Raleigh, North Carolina, Andrew Johnson was the son of illiterate parents. Self-educated and ambitious, Johnson moved to Tennessee, where he worked as a tailor, accumulated a fortune in land and five slaves, and built a career in politics championing the South's common white folk and assailing its planter class. The only senator from a Confederate state to remain loyal to the Union, Johnson held planters responsible for secession. A Democrat all his life, Johnson occupied the White House only because the Republican Party in 1864 had needed a vice presidential candidate who would appeal to Union-supporting Democrats. Johnson vigorously defended states' rights, but not secession, and opposed Republican efforts to expand the power of the federal government. A steadfast supporter of slavery, Johnson had owned slaves until 1862, when Tennessee rebels, angry at his unionism, confiscated them. When he grudgingly accepted emancipation, it was more because he hated planters than sympathized with slaves. The new president harbored unshakable racist convictions. Like Lincoln, 
Johnson stressed the rapid restoration of civil government in the South. Like Lincoln, he promised to pardon most, but not all, ex-rebels. Johnson recognized the state governments created by Lincoln, but set out his own requirements for restoring the other rebel states to the Union. All that the citizens of a state had to do was to renounce the right of secession, repudiate the debts of the Confederacy, and ratify the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, which became part of the Constitution in December 1865. Johnson also returned all confiscated and abandoned land to pardoned ex-Confederates, even if it was already in the hands of freedmen. Reformers were shocked. Instead of punishing planters as he had promised, Johnson canceled the promising beginnings made by General Sherman and the Freedmen's Bureau to settle blacks on land of their own. In the summer of 1865, white Southerners drew up the new state constitutions Johnson's plan of Reconstruction required but they refused to accept even the president's mild requirements. Refusing to renounce secession, the South Carolina and Georgia conventions merely repudiated their secession ordinances, preserving in principle their right to secede. South Carolina and Mississippi refused to disown their Confederate war debts. Mississippi rejected the 13th Amendment, and Alabama rejected it in part. Despite this defiance, Johnson did nothing. White Southerners began to think that by standing up for themselves, they could shape the terms of Reconstruction. New state governments across the South adopted a series of laws known as Black Codes, which denied black rights. The codes sought to keep ex-slaves subordinate to whites by subjecting them to every sort of discrimination. Several states made it illegal for blacks to own a gun. Mississippi made insulting gestures and language by blacks a criminal offense. The codes barred blacks from jury duty. Not a single southern state granted any black the right to vote. At the core of the black codes, however, lay the matter of labor. Legislators sought to hustle freedmen back to the plantations. South Carolina attempted to limit blacks to either farm work or domestic service by requiring them to pay annual taxes of $10 to $100 to work in any other occupation. Mississippi declared that blacks who did not possess written evidence of employment could be declared vagrants and be subject to involuntary plantation labor. Under so-called apprenticeship laws, courts bound thousands of black children, orphans, and others whose parents were deemed unable to support them to work for planter guardians. Johnson refused to intervene. A staunch defender of states' rights, he believed that citizens of every state should be free to write their own constitutions and laws. He was as eager as other white Southerners to restore white supremacy. White men alone must manage the South, he declared. Johnson also recognized that his do-nothing response offered him political advantage. A conservative Tennessee Democrat at the head of a Northern Republican Party, he had begun to look southward for political allies. Despite tough talk about punishing traitors, he personally pardoned 14,000 wealthy or high-ranking ex-Confederates. By pardoning powerful whites, by accepting state governments even when they failed to satisfy his minimal demands, and by acquiescing in the black codes, he won useful Southern friends. In the fall elections of 1865, white Southerners dramatically expressed their mood. To represent them in Congress, they chose former Confederates. Of the 80 senators and representatives they sent to Washington, 15 had served in the Confederate Army, 10 of them as generals. Another 16 had served in civil and judicial posts in the Confederacy. Nine others had served in the Confederate Congress. One, Alexander Stevens, had been vice president of the Confederacy. As one Georgian remarked, it looked as though Richmond had moved to Washington. White Southerners had blundered monumentally. They had assumed that what Johnson was willing to accept, Northern Republicans would accept as well. But Southern resistance compelled even moderates to conclude that ex-rebels were still disloyal and dangerous. The Black Codes became a symbol of Southern intentions to restore all of slavery but its name. The moderate majority of the Republican Party wanted only assurance that slavery and treason were dead. They did not champion black equality, the confiscation of plantations, or black voting rights, as did the radical minority within the party. But Southern resistance had succeeded in forging unity, at least temporarily, among Republican factions. 
In December 1865, Republicans refused to seat the Southerners elected in the fall elections. Rather than accept Johnson's claim that the work of restoration was done, Congress challenged Johnson's reconstruction. Republican Senator Lyman Trumbull declared that the president's policy meant that an ex-slave would be tyrannized over, abused, and virtually re-enslaved without some legislation by the nation for his protection. Early in 1866, the moderates produced two bills that strengthened the federal shield. The Freedmen's Bureau bill prolonged the life of the agency established by the previous Congress. Arguing that the Constitution never contemplated a system for the support of indigent persons, President Andrew Johnson vetoed the bill. Congress failed by a narrow margin to override the President's veto. The moderates designed their second measure, the Civil Rights of 1866, to nullify the Black Codes by affirming African Americans' rights to full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. The Act boldly required the end of racial discrimination in state laws and represented an extraordinary expansion of black rights and federal authority. The President argued that the Civil Rights Bill amounted to unconstitutional invasion of states' rights and vetoed it. In essence, he denied that the federal government had the authority to protect the civil rights of African Americans. In April 1866, an outraged Republican Party again pushed the Civil Rights Bill through Congress and overrode the presidential veto. In July, it passed another Freedmen's Bureau bill and overrode Johnson's veto. For the first time in American history, Congress had overturned presidential vetoes of major legislation. By the summer of 1866, President Andrew Johnson and Congress had dropped their gloves and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe in a bare-knuckle contest unprecedented in American history. Johnson made it clear that he would not budge on either executive authority or policy. Moderate Republicans responded by amending the Constitution. But Johnson's and white Southerners' stubbornness pushed Republican moderates ever closer to the radicals and to acceptance of additional federal intervention in the South. To end the presidential interference, Congress voted to impeach the president for the first time in the nation's history. Soon after, Congress debated whether to make voting rights colorblind, while women championed making voting sex-blind as well. In June 1866, Congress passed the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, and two years later the states ratified it. The most important provisions of this complex amendment made all native-born or naturalized persons American citizens and prohibited states from abridging the privileges and immunities of citizens, depriving them of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and denying them equal protection of the laws. By making blacks national citizens, the amendment provided a national guarantee of equality before the law. In essence, it protected blacks against violation by southern state governments. The 14th Amendment also dealt with voting rights. It gave Congress the right to reduce the congressional representation of states that withheld suffrage from some of its adult male population. In other words, white southerners could either allow black men to vote or see their representation in Washington slashed. Whatever happened, Republicans stood to benefit. If Southern whites granted voting rights to freedmen, Republicans would gain valuable black votes. If whites refused, the number of Southern Democrats in Congress would plunge. The 14th Amendment's suffrage provisions ignored the small band of women who had emerged from the war demanding the ballot. Founding the American Equal Rights Association in 1866, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton lobbied for a government by the people and the whole people, for the people and the whole people. They felt betrayed when their old anti-slavery allies refused to work for women's suffrage. It was the Negroes' hour, Frederick Douglass explained. Senator Charles Sumner suggested that women's suffrage could be the great question of the future. Tennessee approved the 14th Amendment in July, and Congress promptly welcomed the state's representatives and senators back. Had President Johnson counseled other southern states to ratify the amendment, they might have listened. Instead, Johnson advised southerners to reject the 14th Amendment and to rely on him to trounce the Republicans in the fall congressional elections. 
Johnson had decided to make the 14th Amendment the overriding issue of the 1866 elections and to gather its white opponents into a new conservative party, the National Union Party. The president's strategy suffered a setback when whites in several southern cities went on rampages against blacks. Mobs killed 34 blacks in New Orleans and 46 in Memphis. The slaughter shocked Northerners and renewed skepticism about Johnson's claim that Southern whites could be trusted. The 1866 elections resulted in an overwhelming Republican victory. Johnson had bet that Northerners would not support federal protection of black rights and that a racist black lash would punish the Republican Party. But the war was still fresh in Northern minds. When Johnson continued to urge Southerners to reject the 14th Amendment, Every southern state except Tennessee voted it down. After the South rejected the moderates' program, the radicals seized the initiative. Each act of defiance by southern whites had boosted the standing of radicals within the Republican Party. Except for freedmen themselves, no one did more to make freedom the mighty moral question of the age. Radicals such as Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner and Pennsylvania Representative Thaddeus Stevens united in demanding civil and political equality. Southern states were like clay in the hands of the potter, Stevens declared in January 1867, and he called on Congress to begin Reconstruction all over again. In March 1867, Congress overturned the Johnson state governments and initiated military rule of the South. The Military Reconstruction Act and three subsequent acts divided the ten unreconstructed Confederate states into five military districts. Congress placed a Union general in charge of each district and instructed him to suppress insurrection, disorder, and violence, and to begin political reform. After the military had completed voter registration, which would include black men, voters in each state would elect delegates to conventions that would draw up new state constitutions. Each constitution would guarantee black suffrage. When the voters of each state had approved the Constitution and the state legislature had ratified the 14th Amendment, Congress could seat the state's senators and representatives and political reunification would be completed. Radicals proclaimed the provision for black suffrage a prodigious triumph, for it extended far beyond the limited voting provisions of the 14th Amendment. When combined with the disfranchisement of thousands of ex-rebels, it promised to cripple any neo-Confederate resurgence and guarantee Republican state governments in the South. Despite its bold suffrage provision, the Military Reconstruction Act of 1867 disappointed those who also advocated the confiscation of Southern plantations and their redistribution to ex-slaves. Thaddeus Stevens agreed with the freedmen who said, Give us our own land, and we take care of ourselves. But without land, the old masters can hire us or starve us as they please. But most Republicans believed they had provided blacks with all they needed, equal legal rights and the ballot. Besides, confiscation was too radical, even for some radicals. If blacks were to get land, they would have to get it themselves. Declaring that he would rather sever his right arm than sign such a formula he dubbed one for anarchy and chaos, Andrew Johnson vetoed the Military Reconstruction Act, but Congress overrode his veto. With the passage of the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, Congressional Reconstruction was virtually completed. Congress left whites owning most of the South's land, but in a departure that justified the term radical reconstruction, had given black men the ballot. Despite his defeats, Andrew Johnson had no intention of yielding control of Reconstruction. In a dozen ways, he sabotaged Congress's will and encouraged Southern whites to resist. He issued a flood of pardons, waged war against the Freedmen's Bureau, and replaced Union generals eager to enforce Congress's Reconstruction Acts with conservative officers eager to block them. Johnson claimed that he was merely defending the Constitution. At bottom, however, the president acted to protect Southern whites from what he considered the horrors of quote-unquote Negro domination. Radicals argued that Johnson's abuse of his power and his failure to fulfill constitutional obligations to enforce the law were impeachable offenses. According to the Constitution, the House of Representatives can impeach and the Senate can try any federal official for treason, bribery, 
or other high crimes and misdemeanors. But moderates interpreted the Constitution to mean violation of criminal statutes. As long as Johnson refrained from breaking the law, impeachment remained stalled. In August 1867, Johnson suspended Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton from office, as required by the Tenure of Office Act, which demanded the approval of the Senate for the removal of any government official who had been appointed with Senate approval, the President requested the Senate to consent to Stanton's dismissal. When the Senate declined, Johnson removed Stanton anyway. Is the President crazy or only drunk? asked a dumbfounded Hannibal Hamlin. I'm afraid his doings will make us all favor impeachment. News of Johnson's open defiance of the law convinced every Republican in the House to vote for a resolution impeaching the president. Supreme Court Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase presided over the Senate trial, which lasted from March until May 1868. When the vote came, 35 senators voted guilty and 19 not guilty. Impeachment fell one vote short of the two-thirds needed to convict. After his trial, Johnson called a truce, and for the remaining 10 months of his term, Congressional Reconstruction proceeded unhindered by presidential interference. Without interference from Johnson, Congress revisited the suffrage issue. In February 1869, Republicans passed the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibited states from depriving any citizen of the right to vote because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The Reconstruction Acts of 1867 already required black suffrage in the South. The 15th Amendment extended black voting nationwide. Some Republicans, however, found the final wording of the 15th Amendment lame and halting. Rather than guaranteeing the right to vote, the amendment merely prohibited exclusion on grounds of race. The distinction would prove to be significant. In time, white Southerners would devise tests of literacy and property and other apparently non-racial measures that would effectively disfranchise blacks yet not violate the 15th Amendment. But an amendment that guaranteed the right to vote courted defeat outside the South. Rising anti-foreign sentiment against the Chinese in California and European immigrants in the Northeast caused states to resist giving up control of suffrage requirements. In March 1870, after three-fourths of the states had ratified it, the 15th Amendment became part of the Constitution. Women's suffrage advocates, however, condemned the 15th Amendment's failure to extend voting rights to women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony rejected the Republicans' Negro First strategy and pointed out that women remained the only class of citizens wholly unrepresented in the government. The 15th Amendment severed the early feminist movement from its abolitionist roots. Over the next several decades, feminists established an independent suffrage crusade that drew millions of women into political life. After the 15th Amendment, Republicans concluded that black suffrage was the last great point that remained to be settled of the issues of the war and promptly scratched the Negro question from the agenda of national politics. Northerners had no idea of the violent struggles that lay ahead in the South. Northerners believed they had discharged their responsibilities with the Reconstruction Acts and the amendments to the Constitution, but Southerners knew that the battle had just begun. Black suffrage had destroyed traditional Southern politics and established the foundation for the rise of the Republican Party. Gathering outsiders and outcasts, Southern Republicans won elections, wrote new state constitutions, and formed new state governments. Challenging the established class for political control was dangerous business. Equally dangerous were the confrontations that took place on southern farms and plantations, where blacks sought to give fuller meaning to their newly won legal and political equality. Ex-masters had their own ideas about the labor system that should replace slavery, and freedom remained contested territory. Southerners fought pitched battles with one another to determine the contours of their new world. African Americans made up the majority of Southern Republicans. After gaining voting rights in 1867, nearly all eligible black men registered to vote as Republicans, grateful to the party that had freed them and granted them the franchise. Southern blacks did not all have identical political priorities, but they united in their desire for education and equal treatment before the law. 
Northern whites who made the South their home after the war were a second element of the South's Republican Party. Most white Southerners called them carpetbaggers, opportunists who stuffed all their belongings in a single carpet-sided suitcase and headed south to fatten on our misfortunes. But most Northerners who moved south were young men who looked upon the South as they did the West, as a promising place to make a living. Northerners in the Southern Republican Party supported programs that encouraged vigorous economic development along the lines of the Northern free labor model. Southern whites made up the third element of the South's Republican Party. Approximately one out of four white Southerners voted Republican. The other three condemned the one who did as a traitor to his region and his race and called him a scalawag, a term for runty horses and low-down, good-for-nothing rascals. Yeoman farmers accounted for the majority of Southern white Republicans. Some were Unionists who emerged from the war with bitter memories of Confederate persecution. Others were small farmers who wanted to end state government's favoritism toward plantation owners. Yeoman supported initiatives for public schools and for expanding economic opportunity in the South. The South's Republican Party, then, was made up of freedmen, Yankees, and Yeoman, an improbable coalition. The mix of races and regions and classes inevitably meant friction as each group maneuvered to define the party. Still, Reconstruction represented an extraordinary moment in American politics. Blacks and whites joined together in the Republican Party to pursue political change. Formally, of course, only men participated in politics, casting ballots and holding offices. But white and black women also played a part in the political struggle by joining in parades and rallies, attending stump speeches, and even campaigning. Most whites in the South condemned Southern Republicans as illegitimate and felt justified in doing whatever they could to stamp them out. Violence against blacks, the quote-unquote white terror, took brutal institutional form in 1866 with the formation in Tennessee of the Ku Klux Klan, a group of Confederate veterans that quickly developed into a paramilitary organization supporting Democrats. The Klan went on a rampage of whipping, hanging, shooting, burning, and throat-cutting to defeat Republicans and restore white supremacy. Rapid demobilization of the Union Army after the war left only a handful of troops to patrol the entire South. Without effective military protection, Southern Republicans had to take care of themselves. In the fall of 1867, Southern states held elections for delegates to state constitutional conventions as required by the Reconstruction Acts. About 40% of the white electorate stayed home because they had been disfranchised or because they had decided to boycott politics. Republicans won three-quarters of the seats. About 15% of the Republican delegates to the conventions were Northerners who had moved south, 25% were African Americans, and 60% were white Southerners. The conventions brought together serious, purposeful men who hammered out the legal framework for a new society. The Reconstruction Constitutions introduced two broad categories of changes in the South, those that reduced aristocratic privilege and increased democratic equality, and those that expanded the state's responsibility for the general welfare. In the first category, the Constitutions adopted universal male suffrage, abolished property qualifications for holding office, and made more offices elective and fewer appointed. In the second category, they enacted prison reform, made the states responsible for caring for orphans, the insane, and the deaf and mute, and exempted debtors' homes from seizure. To Democrats, these progressive constitutions looked like wild revolution. They were blind to the fact that no constitution confiscated and redistributed land as virtually every former slave wished or disfranchised ex-rebels wholesale as most Southern Unionists advocated. Yet Democrats were convinced that the new constitutions initiated quote-unquote Negro domination. In fact, although 80% of Republican voters were black men, only 6% of Southerners in Congress during Reconstruction were black. The 16 black men in Congress included exceptional men, such as Representative James T. Rapier of Alabama. No state legislature experienced so-called Negro rule despite black majorities in the populations of some states. Southern voters ratified the new state constitutions and swept Republicans into power. When the former Confederate states ratified the 14th Amendment, Congress readmitted them. 
Southern Republicans then turned to a staggering array of problems at home. Wartime destruction littered the landscape. Making matters worse, racial harassment and reactionary violence dogged Southerners who sought reform. Democrats mocked Republican officeholders as ignorant field hands who had only agricultural degrees and brickyard diplomas, but Republicans began a serious effort to rebuild and reform the region. Activity focused on three areas, education, civil rights, and economic development. Every state inaugurated a system of public education. Before the Civil War, whites had deliberately kept slaves illiterate, and planter-dominated governments rarely spent tax money to educate the children of yeomen. By 1875, half of Mississippi's and South Carolina's eligible children were attending school. Although schools were underfunded, literacy rates rose sharply. Public schools were racially segregated, but education remained for many blacks a deeply satisfying benefit of freedom and Republican rule. State legislatures also attacked racial discrimination and defended civil rights. Republicans resisted efforts to segregate blacks from whites, especially in public transportation. Mississippi levied fines and jail terms for owners of railroads and steamboats that pushed blacks into so-called smoking cars or to the lower decks. But passing colorblind laws was one thing, enforcing them was another. A Mississippian complained, Education amounts to nothing. Good behavior counts for nothing. Even money cannot buy for a colored man or woman decent treatment and the comforts that white people claim and can obtain. Despite the laws, segregation, later called Jim Crow, developed at white insistence. Determined to underscore the social inferiority of blacks, whites saw to it that separation by race became a feature of Southern life long before the end of the Reconstruction era. Republican governments also launched ambitious programs of economic development. They envisioned a South of diversified agriculture, roaring factories, and booming towns. State legislatures chartered scores of banks and industrial companies, appropriated funds to fix ruined levees and drain swamps, and went on a railroad-building binge. These efforts fell far short of solving the South's economic troubles, however. Republican spending to stimulate economic growth meant rising taxes and enormous debt that siphoned funds from schools and other programs. The Southern Republicans' record was mixed. To their credit, the biracial party adopted an ambitious agenda to change the South. But money was scarce, the Democrats continued their vicious harassment, and differences threatened the Republican Party from within. Corruption infected Republican governments. Nonetheless, the Republican Party made headway in its efforts to purge the South of aristocratic privilege and racist oppression. Republican governments had less success in overthrowing the long-established white oppression of black farm laborers in the rural South. Ex-slaves who wished to escape slave labor and ex-masters who wanted to reinstitute old oppressions clashed repeatedly. Except for having to pay subsistence wages, Planters had not been required to offer many concessions to emancipation. They continued to believe that African Americans would not work without coercion. Some planters were so discouraged about the prospect of farming with free black labor that they fled the South. Their determination to get away from the free Negro carried them around the world, but especially to Brazil, which seemed to offer the best chance of resurrecting antebellum Southern society because slavery was still legal there. First-hand experience in Brazil shocked most Southern migrants, however. They found race relations that challenged their notions of white supremacy and, most importantly, abolition on the horizon. By 1870, most migrating planters were back home, where they joined those who had stayed in their efforts to restore as much of slavery as they could get away with. Ex-slaves resisted every effort to turn back the clock. They argued that if any class could be described as lazy, it was the planters who, as one former slave noted, lived in idleness all their lives on stolen labor. Freedmen believed that land of their own would anchor their economic independence and end planters' interference in their personal lives. They could then, for example, make their own decisions about whether women and children would labor in the fields. Indeed, within months after the war, perhaps one-third of black women abandoned field labor to work on chores in their own cabins just as poor white women did. 
Black women also negotiated about work ex-mistresses wanted done in the big house. Hundreds of thousands of black children enrolled in school, but without their own land, ex-slaves had little choice but to work on plantations. Although forced to return to the planters' fields, they resisted efforts to restore slave-like conditions. Instead of working for wages, as South Carolinian observed, the Negroes all seemed disposed to rent land, which increased their independence from whites. Out of this tug-of-war between white landlords and black laborers emerged a new system of southern agriculture. Sharecropping was a compromise that offered something to both ex-masters and ex-slaves, but satisfied neither. Under the new system, planters divided their cotton plantations into small farms that freedmen rented, paying with a share of each year's crop, usually half. Sharecropping gave blacks more freedom than the system of wages and labor gangs and released them from day-to-day -day supervision by whites. Black families abandoned the old slave quarters and built separate caverns for themselves on the land they rented. Still, most black families remained dependent on white landlords who had the power to evict them at the end of each growing season. For planters, sharecropping offered a way to resume agricultural production, but it did not allow them to restore the old slave plantation. Sharecropping introduced the country merchant into the agricultural equation. Landlords supplied sharecroppers with land, mules, seeds, and tools, but sharecroppers also needed credit to obtain essential food and clothing before they harvested their crops. Under an arrangement called a crop lien, a merchant would advance goods in exchange for a lien or legal claim on the sharecropper's future crop. Some merchants charged exorbitant rates of interest, as much as 60% on the goods they sold. At the end of the growing season, after the landlord had taken half of the farmer's crop for rent, the merchant took most of the rest. Sometimes the farmer did not earn enough to repay the debt to the merchant, so he would have to borrow more from the merchant and begin the cycle again. An experiment at first, sharecropping soon dominated the cotton south. Lean merchants forced tenants to plant cotton, which was easy to sell, instead of food crops. The result was excessive production of cotton and falling cotton prices, developments that cost thousands of small white farmers their land and pushed them into the great army of poor sharecroppers. The new sharecropping system of agriculture took shape just as the political power of Republicans in the South began to buckle under Democratic pressure. By 1870, after a decade of war and Reconstruction, Northerners wanted to put the Southern problem behind them. Businessmen came to dominate the Republican Party, replacing the band of reformers and idealists who had been prominent in the 1860s. Civil War hero Ulysses S. Grant succeeded Andrew Johnson as president in 1869 and quickly became an issue himself, proving that brilliance on the battlefield does not necessarily translate into accomplishment in the White House. As Northern commitment to defend black freedom eroded, Southern commitment to white supremacy intensified. Without Northern protection, Southern Republicans were no match for the Democrats' economic coercion, political fraud, and bloody violence. One by one, Republican state governments fell in the South. The election of 1876 both confirmed and completed the collapse of Reconstruction. In 1868, the Republican Party's presidential nomination went to Ulysses S. Grant, the North's favorite general. His Democratic opponent, Horatio Seymour of New York, ran on a platform that blasted Reconstruction as, quote, a flagrant usurpation of power, unconstitutional, end quote. The Republicans answered by waving the bloody shirt. That is, they reminded voters that the Democrats were the party of rebellion. Despite a reign of terror in the South, costing hundreds of Republicans their lives, Grant gained a narrow 309,000 vote margin in the popular vote and a substantial victory in the Electoral College. The talents Grant had demonstrated on the battlefield, decisiveness, clarity, and resolution, were less obvious in the White House. While Grant sought both justice for blacks and sectional reconciliation, he surrounded himself with fumbling kinfolk and old friends from his army days and made a string of dubious appointments that led to a series of damaging scandals, otherwise known as rings. 
charges of corruption tainted his vice president, Schuyler Colfax, and brought down two of his cabinet officers. Though never personally implicated in any scandal, Grant was naive and blind to the rot that filled his administration. In 1872, anti-Grant Republicans bolted and launched the Liberal Party. To clean up the corruption, liberals proposed ending the spoil system. To clean up the corruption, liberals proposed ending the spoil system, by which victorious parties rewarded loyal workers with public office and replacing it with a nonpartisan civil service commission that would oversee competitive examinations for appointment to office. Liberals also demanded that the federal government remove its troops from the South and restore home rule, that is, Southern white control. Democrats liked the liberals' Southern policy and endorsed the liberal presidential candidate Horace Greeley, the longtime editor of the New York Tribune. Nevertheless, the Democratic Party was fatally split between five candidates. The nation still felt enormous affection for the man who had saved the Union and re-elected Grant with 56% of the popular vote. Although Grant genuinely wanted to protect black civil and political rights, he understood that most Northerners had grown weary of Reconstruction. Citizens wanted to shift their attention to other issues, especially after the nation slipped into a devastating economic depression in 1873. More than 18,000 businesses collapsed, leaving more than a million workers on the streets. Northern businessmen wanted to invest in the South, but believed that repeated federal intrusion was itself a major cause of instability in the region. Republican leaders began to question the wisdom of their party's alliance with the South's lower classes, its small farmers and sharecroppers. One member of Grant's administration proposed allying with the thinking and influential Native Southerners, the intelligent, well-to-do, and controlling class. Congress, too, wanted to leave Reconstruction behind, but Southern Republicans made that difficult. When the South Republicans begged for federal protection from increasing Klan violence, Congress enacted three laws in 1870 and 1871 that were intended to break the back of white terrorism. The severest of the three, the Ku Klux Klan Act, made interference with voting rights a felony. Federal marshals arrested thousands of Klansmen and came close to destroying the Klan, but they did not end terrorism against blacks. Congress also passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which boldly outlawed racial discrimination in transportation, public accommodations, and juries. Federal authorities never enforced the law aggressively, however, and segregation remained the rule throughout the South. By the early 1870s, the Republican Party had lost its leading champions of African American rights to death or defeat at the polls. Other Republicans concluded that the quest for black equality was mistaken or hopelessly naive. In May 1872, Congress restored the right of office holding to all but 300 ex-rebels. Many Republicans had come to believe that traditional white leaders offered the best hope for honesty, order, and prosperity in the South. Underlying the North's abandonment of Reconstruction was unyielding racial prejudice. Northerners had learned to accept black freedom during the war, but deep-seated prejudice prevented many from accepting black equality. Even the actions they took on behalf of blacks often served partisan political advantage. Northerners generally supported Indiana Senator Thomas A. Hendricks's harsh declaration that, quote, this is a white man's government made by the white man for the white man, end quote. The U.S. Supreme Court also did its part to undermine Reconstruction. The court issued a series of decisions that significantly weakened the federal government's ability to protect black Southerners. In the slaughterhouse cases, the court distinguished between national and state citizenship and ruled that the 14th Amendment protected only those rights that stemmed from the federal government, such as voting in federal elections and interstate travel. Since the court decided that most rights derived from the states, it sharply curtailed the federal government's authority to defend black citizens. Even more devastating, the United States versus Cruikshank ruling said that the Reconstruction Amendments gave Congress the power to legislate against discrimination only by states, not by individuals. The suppression of ordinary crime, such as assault, remained a state responsibility. 
The Supreme Court did not declare Reconstruction unconstitutional, but eroded its legal foundations. The mood of the North found political expression in the election of 1874, when for the first time in 18 years the Democrats gained control of the House of Representatives. Rather than defend Reconstruction from its southern enemies, Northerners steadily backed away from the challenge. By the early 1870s, Southern Republicans faced the forces of Southern racism largely on their own. To most white Southerners, Reconstruction meant intolerable insults. Black militiamen patrolled town streets, black laborers negotiated contracts with former masters, black maids stood up to former mistresses, black voters cast ballots, and black legislators such as James T. Rapier helped enact laws. Whites fought back by extolling the Great Confederate Cause or the Lost Cause. They celebrated their soldiers and made an idol of Robert E. Lee, the embodiment of the Southern gentleman. But the most important way white Southerners responded to Reconstruction was their assault on Republican governments in the South. These biracial governments attracted more hatred than did any other political regimes in American history. The Northern retreat from Reconstruction permitted Southern Democrats to reassert dominance. Taking the name Redeemers, Democrats in the South promised to replace so-called bayonet rule with home rule. They promised that honest, thrifty Democrats would supplant corrupt tax-and-spend Republicans. Above all, Redeemers swore to save Southern civilization from a descent into quote-unquote African barbarism. As one man put it, we must render this either a white man's government or convert the land into a Negro man's cemetery. Southern Democrats adopted a multi-pronged strategy to overthrow Republican governments. First, they sought to polarize the parties around race. They went about gathering all the South's white voters into the Democratic Party, leaving the Republicans to depend on blacks who made up a minority of the population in almost every Southern state. To dislodge whites from the Republican Party, Democrats fanned the flames of racism. A South Carolina Democrat crowed that his party appealed to the, quote, proud Caucasian race whose sovereignty on earth God has proclaimed, end quote. Democrats also exploited the severe economic plight of small white farmers by blaming it on Republicans. Government spending soared during Reconstruction, and small farmers saw their tax burdens skyrocket. In 1871, Mississippi reported that one-seventh of the state's land, 3.3 million acres, had been forfeited for non-payment of taxes. The small farmers' economic distress had a racial dimension. Because few freedmen succeeded in acquiring land, they rarely paid taxes. In Georgia in 1874, blacks made up 45% of the population, but paid only 2% of the taxes. From the perspective of a small white farmer, Republican rule meant that he was not only paying more taxes, but paying them to aid blacks. If racial pride and financial hardship proved insufficient to drive yeomen from the Republican Party, Democrats turned to terrorism. Night Riders targeted white Republicans as well as blacks for murder and assassination. Whether white or black, a dead radical is very harmless, South Carolina Democratic leader Martin Gary told his followers. Still, the primary victims of white violence were black Republicans. Violence escalated to an unprecedented ferocity on Easter Sunday in 1873 in tiny Colfax, Louisiana. When Democrats turned to fraud to win a local election, black Republicans refused to accept the result and occupied the courthouse. After three weeks, 165 white men attacked and set the courthouse on fire. When the blacks tried to surrender, the attackers murdered them. At least 81 black men were slaughtered that day. Although the federal government indicted the white killers, the Supreme Court ruled that it did not have the right to prosecute. And since local whites would not prosecute neighbors who killed blacks, the defendants in the Colfax massacre went free. Even before adopting the all-out white supremacist tactics of the 1870s, Democrats had taken control of the governments of Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. The new campaign brought fresh gains. The Redeemers retook Georgia in 1871, Texas in 1873, 
in Arkansas and Alabama in 1874. As the state election approached in Mississippi in 1876, the Republican governor appealed to Washington for federal troops to control the violence, only to hear from the Attorney General that the, quote, whole public are tired of these annual autumnal outbreaks in the South, end quote. Abandoned, Mississippi Republicans succumbed to the Democratic onslaught in the fall elections. By 1876, only three Republican state governments survived in the South. The year 1876 witnessed one of the most chaotic elections in American history. The election took place in November, but not until March 2nd of the following year did the nation know who would be inaugurated president on March 4th. Sixteen years after Lincoln's election, Americans feared that a presidential election would again precipitate civil war. The Democrats nominated New York's governor, Samuel J. Tilden, who targeted the corruption of the Grant administration and the despotism of Republican Reconstruction. The Republicans put forward Rutherford B. Hayes, governor of Ohio. Privately, Hayes considered bayonet rule a mistake, but concluded that waving the bloody shirt remained the Republicans' best political strategy. On election day, Tilden tallied nearly 4.3 million votes to Hayes's less than 4.1 million. But in the all-important electoral college, Tilden fell one vote short of the majority required for victory. The electoral votes of three states, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida, the only remaining Republican governments in the South, remained in doubt because both Republicans and Democrats in those states claimed victory. To win, Tilden needed only one of the 19 contested votes. Hayes had to have all of them. Congress had to decide who had actually won the elections in the three southern states and thus who would be president. The Constitution provided no guidance. Democrats controlled the House and Republicans controlled the Senate. Congress created a special electoral commission to arbitrate the disputed returns. All of the commissioners voted their party affiliation, giving every state to the Republican Hayes and putting him over the top in electoral votes. Some outraged Democrats vowed to resist Hayes' victory. Rumors flew of an impending coup d'etat and renewed civil war. But the impasse was broken when negotiations behind the scenes resulted in an informal understanding known as the Compromise of 1877. In exchange for a Democratic promise not to block Hayes' inauguration and to deal fairly with the freedmen, Hayes vowed to refrain from using the army to uphold the remaining Republican regimes in the South and to provide the South with substantial federal subsidies for railroads. Stubborn Tilden supporters bemoaned the stolen election and damned his fraudulency, Rutherford B. Hayes. Old guard radicals such as William Lloyd Garrison denounced Hayes' bargain as a, quote, policy of compromise, of credulity, of weakness, of subserviency, of surrender, end quote. But the nation as a whole celebrated, for the country had weathered a grave crisis. The last three Republican state governments in the South fell quickly once Hayes withdrew the U.S. Army. Reconstruction came to an end. In 1865, when General Carl Schurz visited the South, he discovered, he said, a revolution but half accomplished. White Southerners resisted the passage from slavery to free labor, from white racial despotism to equal justice, and from white political monopoly to biracial democracy. The old elite wanted to get things back as near to slavery as possible, Schurz reported, while African Americans such as James T. Rapier and some whites were eager to exploit the revolutionary implications of defeat and emancipation. Although the northern-dominated Republican Congress refused to provide for blacks' economic welfare, it employed constitutional amendments to require ex-Confederates to accept legal equality and share political power with black men. Congress was not willing to extend such power to women, however. Conservative Southern whites fought ferociously to recover their power and privilege. When Democrats regained control of politics, whites used both state power and private violence to wipe out many of the gains of Reconstruction, leading one observer to conclude that the North had won the war, but the South had won the peace. The Redeemer counter-revolution, however, did not mean a return to chattel slavery. 
Northern victory in the Civil War ensured that ex-slaves no longer faced the auction block and could send their children to school, worship in their own churches, and work independently on their own rented farms. Sharecropping, with all of its injustice and hardships, provided still more autonomy and economic welfare than bondage had. It was limited freedom, to be sure, but it was not slavery, at least not of the old sort. The Civil War and emancipation set in motion the most profound upheaval in the nation's history. War destroyed the largest slave society in the New World. The world of masters and slaves gave way to that of landlords and sharecroppers. Washington increased its role in national affairs, and the victorious North set the nation's compass toward the expansion of industrial capitalism and the final conquest of the West. Despite massive changes, however, the Civil War remained only a half-accomplished revolution. By not fulfilling the promises the nations seemed to hold out to black Americans at war's end, Reconstruction represents a tragedy of enormous proportions. The failure to protect blacks and guarantee their rights had enduring consequences. It was the failure of the first Reconstruction that made the modern civil rights movement necessary. The legacy of the Civil War continues to cast a long and dark shadow over the United States, infusing our political and popular cultures. The southern states of the former Confederacy successfully moved American thinking about the war during the 1880s and 1890s toward an interpretation that cast the so-called late unpleasantness as a preventable and regrettable conflict. The campaign for southern independence rebranded as the Lost Cause. The war was lost not because of inherent Southern faults or critical defeats on the battlefield, but due to a combination of a failure of resolve from the Confederate political leadership and a sort of divine chastisement, but not for the sin of slavery, but rather for complacency. Had the Northern states not been allowed to delegalize slavery after the Revolution by some article or amendment to the Constitution, for instance, or a different iteration of the Missouri Compromise been implemented that would permit slavery in more of the West, maybe the North's growing opposition to slavery could have been prevented. In any case, by the turn of the 20th century, Americans, most of them Northerners, touring restored Southern plantation mansions, bought into the myth of an idyllic Old South wherein paternalistic masters ruled their little worlds populated by deferential women and loyal, obedient slaves. The war, increasing numbers of Americans believed, destroyed a kind of pastoral paradise that the Confederacy struggled valiantly to preserve. It would serve us well to remind ourselves that the flag known as the Stars and Bars was the actual official flag of the Confederacy for the first few years of its existence, and not the more familiar battle flag known as the Southern Cross. As the war dragged on, there was some apparent confusion on battlefields between the Stars and Bars and the U.S. flag, and so the Confederate government chose to redesign the national flag to incorporate the Southern Cross in 1863. However, the dominance of the color white, which was meant to be symbolic of white supremacy and Christian purity, nevertheless was mistaken on battlefields for the plain white flag of surrender, and so a final redesign in early 1865 was meant to undercut this, though with obviously mixed results. The Lost Cause ideology gained traction and popularity with the end of Reconstruction in 1877, and the state of Mississippi led a resurgence of Southern nationalist pride when it changed its flag in 1894 to include the Confederate battle flag in its design, while other states adopted flag motifs that recalled it or the stars and bars. Virginia's flag changed little from the one adopted after secession, which bears the words from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar quoted by John Wilkes Booth when he assassinated Abraham Lincoln, sic semper tyrannis, thus ever to tyrants, meaning death. Countless southern cities and towns, streets and highways and public buildings are named for Confederate Army officers and politicians.
As African Americans campaigned for their civil rights during World War I, the Ku Klux Klan reformed, with chapters cropping up all over the United States. Its post-Civil War forebears celebrated in the first blockbuster film in history, Birth of a Nation, directed by D.W. Griffith in 1915. President Woodrow Wilson, a native Virginian who had been a history professor at Princeton University before entering politics, attended a special screening of the movie at the White House and praised it as, quote, history written with lightning. Southern state and local governments, along with organizations such as the Daughters of the Confederacy, began erecting memorials dedicated to Confederate heroes and ordinary soldiers. The Southern Cross began to appear on flagpoles throughout the former Confederacy and beyond, especially the West, and African Americans who protested these developments became targets of organized violence and intimidation. Mobs of white men would abduct black men to lynch or burn alive from trees and lampposts. Such occasions often treated as festive events attended by women and children who would pose for photographs and collect souvenirs, most often bones and teeth that were sometimes fashioned into jewelry or mementos. New Jim Crow laws further curtailed black voting rights, while law enforcement agencies concentrated their efforts on black communities. Another blockbuster film, one of the first to feature the use of Technicolor, was Gone with the Wind, which came out in 1939. Based on a best-selling novel by Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind perpetuates the myth of the Old South and glorifies the lost cause. In 1946, Disney Studios released Song of the South, a serial comic film that innovatively mixed live action with animation and presents a vision of the post-Civil War South as a place where African Americans remain comfortable in subservience to whites, who for their part display no sign of racist animosity. After World War II, when African Americans renewed their fight for civil rights, Southern states began flying the Confederate battle flag below their state flags in front of their capitals and administrative buildings to signal their resistance to federal desegregation laws, while the state of Georgia went farther, changing its flag in 1956 to include the battle flag. The battle flag went on to become a symbol not just of Southern resistance to African American civil rights, but also of Southern pride and state resistance to the federal government, showing up as a design motif on clothing, bedding, shower curtains, rugs, as well as bumper stickers on cars and trucks. When South Carolina's decades-long flying of the Southern Cross at the State House in Columbia created controversy during the election of 2000, Georgia legislators called for changing its state flag to remove the battle flag in 2001, opting for a flag design recalling Georgia's history as one of the original 13 states, but also included a ribbon showing all of the previous iterations of the state flag, including the previous one with the battle flag. Not surprisingly, a furor ensued, and a new design in 2003 seemed to have solved the problem, except that it clearly takes its design from the stars and bars, which virtually nobody noticed at the time, and few have bothered to criticize since. Since the year 2000, some vehicles began sporting small stars and bars decals that most people do not know was the first Confederate national flag, and is a subtler way of expressing an attachment to the Confederacy and what it stood for. In June 2020, Mississippi voted to change its flag to remove the Southern Cross, settling on a design that seems to indicate that a lesson had been learned from Georgia's experience. Nevertheless, the Southern Cross remains a powerful and still popular symbol of, depending on the context, attachment to the myth of the Old South, regional pride, a desire to see the resurrection of the Confederacy, defense of states' rights against federal government, hatred of African Americans, or acknowledgement of the complexities of Southern history. The current debates over the existence and proposed removal of Confederate monuments and statues to Confederate figures demonstrates the endurance of the still unhealed wounds inflicted by the Civil War and how they created political fault lines that continue to erupt in violence and bloodshed. The United States' slow and halting progress toward a brighter, more equitable future will, I hope, continue. 
but that progress has to be done while reckoning with the past as it was, and not as some would wish it to be. Here I am reminded of Benjamin Franklin's question about the sun motif on Washington's chair during the Constitutional Convention. Are the troubles that have afflicted the United States merely clouds briefly obscuring a glorious sunrise, or grim harbingers dimming the sun at twilight?